Sage, he was saying the nicest things about you guys? Do you mind if I quote you? Go ahead. The Salt Lake City fans are the best fans that I've encountered, and I've been doing these cons for a long time. Quote. I love you too. Now, it's, it's really important for you guys to understand that you guys are building something that's really magnificent here. To Brian and to David, the guys who have been really moving this thing forward. Uh, because of your support, this Comic-Con convention has become uh, the third largest in the country. This is the second year. <laughs> and uh, as of right now, in the last two days, we've had over 100,000 people. What it means, what it means is that basically that Salt Lake and the around the, the regions around here uh, really, really appreciate and want this to happen. And that's really amazing. And I have to tell you, um, I'm really seriously very grateful. Every single person I've met here that has come over and said hello to me and shaken my hand, and I, I talk a lot. I don't know if you've come over. How many people have come over? Raise your hands. For those of you that haven't, too bad. <laughs> you could actually talk to me. I mean, really, one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, we really get down to it. And it's really amazing and wonderful because the kind of people that you are comes out. And it really is simple to see. And you can feel the warmth, the understanding, the commitment, the passion of people. You go to some uh, conventions and you don't get that. You don't get that at all. Matter of fact, you get a sense of urgency and, and a sense of possessiveness. Like they own you or they feel like they, you know, you, you have to do something for them. And it's really, it's a strange feeling because we're here really to say thank you to you. That's why everybody's here. And uh, it's a big love fest. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart, man. And anybody that wants to ask me questions, yeah, please he said start lining start up. Right away, start so. lining up so we don't have to wait for you to walk all the way down here. All right? So don't get lazy. Just come on up here and we can get to the well, I say we start. we got a line already. Yeah, I know we do. Let's, <laughs> Let's start. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into it right off the bat. Go for it, man. How you doing? I think we're doing great. Thank you. Awesome. Huge fan. I grew up watching Miami Vice. Did he, did he scare you as Lieutenant Castillo? He scared me as a kid. As I was a scared of death. Bad man. Scared of death. Um, my question is, uh, what are some of the memories you can share about my advice and that? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, you, you're talking about some really extraordinary time. Some that, uh, honestly, are just unbelievable. Um, I don't know how many of you, but you guys are all too young. <laughs> the elders just started screaming. You know? All the young people are going, what the hell is that? <laughs> Miami what? No, actually, the, the, the most, I guess the stories that most make people like, oh my God, are the stories of how the situation got started. I was the second lieutenant. The first lieutenant had gotten, uh, Gregory Sierra had gotten uh, killed by his own request. He told Michael, man, kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I want off. And it was true. I mean, he wanted off the show. So they killed him in the third episode. <laughs> and they were shooting, they were rolling. So I was called on, on, on the day, uh, one day, and Michael calls me up and says, listen, we need you to do our, our uh, we, I need you on the show. I, need you, I want you to be on Miami Vice. And I, look, at Miami Vice hadn't aired yet. There was nothing, I mean, nobody knew. But just the title got me. I said, Miami Vice, oh boy. Sounds like Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of those kind of things, you know? Where the hero's always the hero, and you know you know who the hero is, and the heroes always win, you know. 
And, and sure enough, when they sent me the, the tapes of the first two shows, it was that way. They had dismissed the FBI, they had dismissed the CIA, they had dismissed their own lieutenant. That's why he wanted off the show. There was no respect for anybody. Everybody, you know, they would be doing a scene and all of a sudden, you know, they'd be talking to the, the governor of the state and then they'd look at each other and they'd give themselves that look like they know. And then they'd look back at the governor and go, <laughs> and of course, no one's supposed to know except the audience. Oh, they know. They got. They're going to take care of it. So that kind of filmmaking and that kind of acting, kind of stuff that was going on, and I was scared of this because basically it's the kind of stuff that I, I mean, I, I turned down Hill Street Blues. I turned down um, NYPD Blue. Now those shows didn't do that. Okay, those shows didn't even get close. People to died on those shows. Yeah, it was really tough. So in essence, to make a long story short, I took the job on one condition that I had total creative control and, uh, of my character and that I had a non-exclusive contract. So that means that I could come and go as I pleased. <laughs> and that's the reason I got to do Stand and Deliver and I got to do Mama Lucia, which was uh, <laughs> I got to do Triumph and Spirit. I got to do a lot of movies during the time period that I was doing my because uh, I couldn't sign an exclusive contract. And they kept on raising the, the, he called me back five different times and he kept on raising the, 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 the price <laughs> on my paycheck. <laughs> and and I, at one point I took the phone away from my ear and I just said, man, if I only knew that all I had to do was say no. <laughs> I started, started saying no a long time ago. But, so when I took the job, I took it under the, that, that understanding. So he says, he finally checkmated me because we were working with NBC at the time. And he ended up saying to me, uh, okay, you got it. He called me back the last time. And he says, you got a non-exclusive contract and you have creative control of the character. And, and I said to him, because he checkmated me. And I said, oh man, I never thought that they would do that. <laughs> never, you know? So now he checkmated me and I said, okay, and I'll take the last offer you made. So, so it was really more money than my father had made in his entire lifetime. I was going to make it 20 episodes. Oh. It's terrible. I mean, it's really, really hard to take. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's being serious. I am. <laughs> serious as a heart attack. Think about it. Your parents worked their entire lives for 45 years, right? breaking their backs and doing stuff that's just really hard to do. You know, blue collar stuff, you know, welder, you know, working at that point. And then all of a sudden, you know, all right, we'll give you this, you know, and then just pour money just <laughs> and you say to yourself, like, man, this is not fair. It really isn't fair. And it isn't, guys. It really isn't. And, uh, you know, it's like what we pay school teachers versus what we pay, you know, athletes. Woo! Yeah. I've never seen one pope, I've never seen one president, I've never seen one, you know, engineer, I've never seen one, uh, you know, anything, scientists do it without a teacher, ever. So, it just hit me that way, because that's how I, I got into this. So you asked me the question. I ended up, the funniest thing about this is that I ended up on the show. And they tell me that night, they called me back and told me, you got to be on the airplane tonight. They said, you're in front of camera tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Get a haircut. I didn't get a haircut, man. <laughs> look at my, look at me. Guys. You're going to see that they are. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing that, that, that was funny is that I didn't change. I, I went on stage the way I was. I don't wear makeup on stage, so. I just like walk on me and I called up the, the costume designer designer calls me up and immediately this is how it started. Okay. You asked me the funniest thing about Miami Vines? This is how it started. Right? With me saying no and them saying I'll give it to you, me saying you can't because you don't do that and say we will, we'll change it. And now I've got creative control of my character. I have a non exclusive contract and I'm on my way to Miami. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Boom! That's <a> <laughs> yeah. So the costume designer calls me up and says, uh, Ed, we're, we need your sizes. I said, okay, I gave her my sizes. And he said, I said, okay, this is what I need. I need to uh, uh, go to Kmart and buy a suit. 
black one. Blues Brothers. I mean, just really before the Blues, I mean, <laughs> before the Blues Brothers is 84. And it, I said, buy a, a black suit and wash it. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious, and wash it. And then don't dry it, I mean, don't iron it, just dry it, let it hang on a hanger and just dry it, okay? And, and she goes, oh, we, we have a style in the show, and of course, you know, we have a style. So I can imagine the room probably put me in Armani or something, <laughs> but Jesus, I said, because I saw them, I saw the show, and I said, wow, they are putting. They're, they were using Versace. Next year's Versace, they were using this year. So they were setting the trends, right? It's a great commercial. It was, big one. So I said, give me this stuff, and, and I said, I want wrestling shoes. And then she says, excuse me, but we have a, a, you know, Michael has a strict daughter. I said, please just tell Michael this is what I want. And please have it ready because I'll be there at seven o'clock and I'll be on the stage by eight o'clock to start working. So, and then she goes, well, I'll, 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 I'm gonna talk to him. I said, fine. And so I got on the plane, I'm, I'm flying over there and I'm all the way over, I'm going, oh my God, what am I gonna do? This is really serious. So first thing I did, first day of work, I got into a fight with both Phil Michael Thomas and Don Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat, I mean, I said, Shh. I told Don Johnson, I remember when Phil Michael Thomas came up to me the very first scene, I was shooting the very first scene. He comes up to me and he goes, uh, you know, that's how they do, you know, they, that's what, uh, this is, this is Crockett's girlfriend. We're by the creek and he goes, this, this is his girlfriend from high school, man. She was shot in the back of the head five times. And I look at him and I say, and this is not written, you know, I'm, I, <laughs> don't you ever come up into my face like this again. <laughs> I'm terrible. He's, he's going, he doesn't know what to say. I mean, it, it, where is that in the script? What, you know, what, what show are you doing? And I, first day, first scene, first take. <laughs> No, no, and he just, and then, they, and then Doc Johnson, Don Johnson comes over and grabs him because now he's, he's like, he's the star, man. I mean, he's the star, you know? He's Phil Michael Thomas, you know, Tubbs, Ricardo Tubbs. And I said, whoa, and I just let him have it. And he turned around, they grabbed him, and they, they, he had to grab him because he like, he said, you know, he like got defensive. And, and, and Don grabbed him, and, and the, the director goes, cut, that's good. Okay, he knew what he had. The second scene was with Don Johnson inside my office. And I, you guys are, I've never, I haven't told a story like this before, this is the first time. You guys all deserve it, by the way. <laughs> this is really inside stuff, right? When you look at the program and you see when I arrive, you'll see what I mean. And when you go look at Miami Vice again, you'll see all these scenes, you're gonna say, holy mackerel, that's when you did it. But um, the second thing was when Don, and when Don came into the office, I shut the door before we started the scene, and the scene was he was coming from outside, and, you know, and he would swing the door open, and then he'd come into the office, and he'd uh, say the, the scene, we'd do the scene. And uh, then we'd practice it again, and I shut the door, but he would open the door before I started, and then he'd come and he'd walk in and, and he'd throw this thing on. I'd put this thing down, put in a uh, manila folder down, and we'd do the scene. Okay, we're ready to go. Let's start it. Are quiet on the set? Let's do it. Okay. I shut the door. He comes over and goes, no, Ed, Ed, leave the door open, man. There's no door. It's closed and this is the OCB room and, and there's no, no, everything's open. We just walk in and I, I, we don't mess with doors. I said, excuse me, Don, I'm sorry. Um, this is my office. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, Ed, I said, Don, and I knew Don. I had worked with Phil, Michael, Phil and Michael Thomas in 1971. I had worked with Don Johnson in 1973. We had worked together. We knew each other. It wasn't like, you know, I came to work and I didn't know these guys. We had known each other. So I, I, I said, Don, shut the door. And, and knock on the door before you come in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, this is a, I'm the lieutenant. This is my office. I just arrived. You see me walking into this episode carrying a flower in a box. 
with, and I told them, that you should have seen, this is crazy. I'm just starting to remember. <laughs> <laughs> the production designer, okay, I won't even tell you what, what, the, what the costume designer did to me, okay? I won't get, get into that one, you know? But I wore my black suit, as you all know, okay? And it was a wash and wear suit, and it was not ironed, and you, you know, you all see what my, I never changed. I wore the same suit for five years that I was on the show. And uh, so, <laughs> Don says, uh, you know, don't open up this can of worms with me, Eddie. I said, excuse me? <laughs> Don, stop. Stop. Well, where are, where, what is wrong with you? He goes, Ed, Ed, the door will be left open. And I said, Don, 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 no. <laughs> This is my office, my space, okay? Shut the door. <laughs> and he goes, well, we'll see about this. And he leaves. He leaves. One hour goes by, <laughs> two hours go by, everybody's on the set going, holy <laughs> <shit."> <laughs> <laughs> So, on the third hour, the producer comes in. And uh, uh, I think we, we finally worked this out. Uh, I don't know. Now, you know, we're spending, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. So that's tens of thousands of dollars an hour. And, and we're not shooting one ounce of film. We're not doing anything. We're just sitting on our hands here waiting for Don that went into his trailer to come out of his trailer to solve this problem. And uh, finally, you know, I said, okay, are we ready? He says, yeah, okay. So I get behind my desk and I shut the door. <laughs> I sit there and I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting for the director. The director says, "Okay, go ahead and say, let's go." I hadn't seen the guy. I hadn't seen nothing. I didn't, we didn't talk. We hadn't done anything. I hear, <laughs> <laughs> and the door swings open, smashes against the, the, my, the all of these uh, uh, drawers, these uh, shelves, aluminum. Uh, you know the file cabinets, the file cabinets the, the, made out of steel. You know the old kind. And, and, and the windows had Venetian blinds on them. <laughs> so they go <laughs> And he comes in and he, and he's, uh, he has his envelope in his hand and throws it at me on the desk. Boom! And I had told the production designer, of course, you know, they had all kinds of stuff when I got there. They had all kinds of books in the sh bookshelves. They had all kinds of papers all over my desk. They had pipes. They had all kinds of stuff all over the place. I said, take it all out. I, I want nothing in this room. He goes, excuse me. I want nothing in this room. So the room was completely barren because the other lieutenant had been killed. And that was all he <laughs> I said, I don't want anything. I get everything out. I want to clean. If you leave anything, leave a little box of aspirin right at the corner of the, of the desk. That's it, that's it, okay? And so he threw the, the door open and, and he comes in, nothing's anywhere, it's, everything's, and he throws this at me. I look, boom, throws, and, I, and the scene's, and I look at the paper, and I look a little bit up. I don't even look at his eyes, I just look up. I grab the thing, and I turn around sideways, I look at it, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of this. And that, I, I didn't even do the scene. <laughs> and we don't do, I didn't do the scene. And I said, okay, I'll take care of this. And so he walks and he walks out. And that's the scene, right? From that day, for almost the whole year of filming, almost like 13 to 15 episodes, I never looked once at him again. <laughs> <laughs> Him or Philip Mike Thomas. I never looked at them again. They'd come into the office and this is where I'd be against the wall. <laughs> now, have you ever tried to be real cool when somebody's not looking at you and giving you any respect? It's really hard to be real cool. So their cool went right out the window. <laughs> it was from that moment on that the show really took off. <laughs> so, 
Except the steel scared the hell out of me. And Don Johnson and Philip Michael Dodge. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Dr. Strange, your question, please. I recently saw Mi Familia, and I'd never heard of this movie before. And I was wondering, I had two questions. One, is there any movie you've done which you wish was more widely known? Maybe Mi Familia, maybe another one. And what is your favorite memory of working on Mi Familia? I, I would like all my films to be more <laughs> widely <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't happen in my book. <laughs> I'm curious, do you think the situation has improved for Latinos, and what do you think can be done to further their role in Hollywood? It, it's gotten worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, it, it, guys, we have to realize it's... It'll change, just out of the numbers, you know, Latinos in the United States of America, making up a little under, they say 17 to 18%. I gotta tell you guys, we're well over 20, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> so I really get angry, okay? All the history taught from the first grade through the 12th grade is European-based history. Well, you're not really learning too much about anybody else, you know? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, it's okay that we, we give praise because the European contribution has been extremely incredible. But if you look and you say, and I say to you, do you know that there's only one United States national hero that we have ever said thank you to as a nation of color in the United States of America? And that is Martin Luther King, that's it. The body has, and gives out messages to, to the rest of the body. The brain gives out messages to the rest of the body. Move my feet, okay. How does it get there? It gets there through the, the messages going through the backbone. If anything messes up the backbone, then the messages don't get out to the rest of the body. And you, you break the third or fourth vertebrae, and you're gonna be either paraplegic or quadriplegic, and then the messages don't get through anymore. Well, that's what art is. That's what books, you know, art authors or paintings or, dance or music and film and television and theater, they're the backbone. They allow the messages going from those artists to hit the rest of the body, us, okay? That's how it works, okay? So when we don't have access, when indigenous people don't have access, Ramon Esteves, had he kept Ramon Esteves, none of you would have seen him because he wouldn't have been Martin Sheen. <laughs> And he wouldn't have done Apocalypse Now, he wouldn't have done all the stuff he did because he was a Martin Sheen. He was, you know, just another, you know, Caucasian European person, so use him. But in essence, that's the difficulty. And, and that's what I loved about Battlestar. <laughs> Battlestar, forget it. You didn't even care. You know?